I may not seem to you a millionaire And the name of honor I don't wear All that heaven holds is mine Don't feel sad for me For I'm an heir to a city That's beyond compare All that heaven holds is mine All that heaven holds Jesus on the throne Yes, all that heaven holds is mine. All with precious blood, He so freely gave, shown in perfect line, just to make the way. Yes, all that heaven holds is mine. Not a tear or sigh, not a won or need. We'll have perfect health and lasting peace. All that heaven holds is mine. Beauty all around and a mansion too. And our Jesus face, it will be in view. All that heaven holds is mine. Yes, all that heaven holds is mine. All with precious blood, He so freely gave, shown in perfect light, just to make the way. Yes, all that heaven holds is mine. All that heaven holds, Jesus on the throne. Yes, all that heaven holds is mine. Because of his precious blood, he so freely gave, shone in perfect light, just to make the way. Yes, all that heaven holds is mine. In this morning, and uh, by the choir and our special numbers. I'm glad Jesus cares. Amen. Well, it's good to see all of you in the house of God today. I appreciate this good number being with us on this Father's Day. And I would like also to wish all the fathers a happy Father's Day. We normally have some little special activities on Mother and Father's Day. We uh, have a little something for the oldest father and mother and the one with the most kids here. Uh, we didn't get to do that for the mothers, so we decided not to do that for the fathers. We want to be fair about it, and if you dads are upset about it, you can meet me in the parking lot later. No. We'll, and David will discuss it with you. <laughs> but we do wish all of you a happy Father's Day, and, and so we, um, you know, when it comes to Mother's Day and Father's Day, we do, can't help but think about our own and those that have gone on before us and uh, you know we we kind of have a, a little unique situation not unique our family has a situation where we have a dad with dementia and uh, when death takes that loved one it's difficult but with dementia you have to see him leave twice and uh, so I want to just say thank you to all the fathers who've lived in front of us and who have now gone on to glory and are awaiting on us and one day we'll see them again praise the Lord and uh, we appreciate all the fathers that are here today take your Bibles this morning with me and be turning to the book of Ezekiel chapter number 47 Ezekiel chapter number 47 uh, one announcement I did not make it to Scott to give to him uh, we've had a report of a lost diamond necklace. So if anybody f sees anything like that here, 
uh, please let us know so we can get it back to the rightful owner. I tell you, as, uh, as much scouring and cleaning goes on in this church between every single service, if it's in here, it'll be found, amen? So please keep your eye out for that and let us know if you find that so we can get it back to the rightful owner. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 47, we're in the midst of the vision that God has given to his prophet Ezekiel. And um, the longer I live, the older I get, uh, the more it seems to be impressed upon my heart the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We can't really serve God if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. If we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, then we're not giving God our best. He gave us His best. Uh, he never quit on us. He never, he never gave us half His best. He always gave us His very best. No greater place than we see Him giving His best than on Calvary when He gave us His Son to die for us in our place. And we as the children of God should desire in our hearts to give God our best. Uh, after what He's done for us, what He has, what He's doing for us now, and what He has in store for us, is all God's best. They just sung about that. And uh, everything that He has for us, He wants us to have. I want to talk about the fullness of the Spirit of God this morning. And I want to use this vision uh, that God gave Ezekiel here in chapter 47. He let him see something that He wanted him to learn. And I pray that we'll learn the lesson today as well. In Ezekiel 47, I hope you have your place, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east. And the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran, ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that held the line in his hand, went forth eastward. He measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand, and he brought me through the waters. And the waters were to the knees. And he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Stop reading in verse 6. Keep your Bible open to that place with me, if you will, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and worship you this morning, something we'll never take for granted again. Thank you for all that are in attendance today. Bless them for their faithfulness to come. I pray that each one will find their, the need of their heart met in Christ today. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that we'll not only hear it, but we'll listen to it. And we'll take it in unto us. And let it do its work of grace in our heart, for it truly is that, that two-edged sword that's the sharpest that's ever been, that 
cuts coming and going and reaches down into our very being. Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God will manifest Himself in the service today in the lives of each and every one. The Spirit of God, I pray for you to fill me while I preach your word today. Thank you for the message and pray that your will be done now. Overshadow me, Lord. I ask in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. And amen. In the prophecy or in this vision that God has given to Ezekiel, He shows Ezekiel a river. It doesn't start out that way. It becomes a river. A river doesn't start out a river. A river begins as a headwater somewhere. Many times a river begins its origin in a, a place where there's very little water at all. The Mississippi, the mighty Mississippi River uh, that flows all the way to the Gulf of Mexico has its headwaters in a little knee-deep creek in the state of Minnesota. And it turns to that great river. You may not know this, but the mighty Cape Fear River that runs into the Atlantic Ocean in Wilmington, or below Wilmington at Fort Fisher, the headwaters of the Cape Fear River are just right over here between Kernersville and Greensboro, where the Hall River begins. But it becomes a river. And the water of the river in this passage of Scripture today, we will equate to the Spirit of God. He is mentioned as water. And here in this passage of Scripture, we see this river that begins from the throne. And in prophecy, this river that Ezekiel will be privileged with seeing is the river of life, as referenced in Revelation chapter 22 and verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. As we look at this river as a type of the Holy Spirit of God, I want to preach this morning on the fullness of the Spirit of God. First of all, I'd like you to notice the source of this river. The source of the river in the book of Revelation tells us that the river of life comes from the throne of God. It proceeds forth from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Here in our passage of Scripture, the Bible tells us that the Lord took Ezekiel to the door of the house. And we'll understand that the Lord took him to the house or to the door of the house of God. And he begins to show him this vision of water proceeding forth from this house. And I want you to notice that the, the water that Ezekiel is shown, the waters that Ezekiel will be taken through are the waters that proceeded forth from the throne of God. Likewise, the Holy Spirit of God, according to John 15 and 26, came from God. Jesus tells us there in that verse that when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. We see that the source of the river of life, the source of the Spirit of God, is from heaven. Just as the Father is in heaven, just as the Son came from heaven, so the Spirit of God came from heaven and indwells among all those who have trusted Christ as Savior. I want you to notice the second thing about that river from verse number 1 is not only the source of the river, but the course of the river. There's a very important landmark that is given here that the waters passed over that the waters passed over before they could be received of Ezekiel. And that is in verse number 1 where the Bible says, The waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the 
altar. The altar is a picture of the cross. The altar is a picture of Calvary. And before the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus first had to suffer and to be crucified and bleed and die upon that cross and be buried and rise again day. And after Jesus died upon the cross, then was the Holy Spirit given unto man. And so we see the source of the river is from God in heaven. We see the course of the river passed over the altar of the cross. You know, the Bible tells us in Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for thee upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul, the cross. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit. You cannot be brought unto the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot indwell you and use you and fill you until you've gone to the altar, until you've gone by the cross of Calvary. But then I want you to notice thirdly in the text in Ezekiel 47, we see the power of the river. We see the power of the river in verse number 8 where it is given to us and it is the power to restore. I want you to look at verse 8. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out of the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. My friend, uh, the, 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 the things that are making you sick spiritually which is sin can only be healed and you can only be restored by the Spirit of God. Not only does the river have the power to restore in verse number 8 but it has the power to revive in verse number 9. The Bible tells us in verse 9 and he and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth whithersoever the river shall come shall live and there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither for they shall be healed and everything shall live whether the river cometh the river not only restores the river revives and wherever the spirit of God is there is life my friend and there is no life without the spirit of God if we don't have the spirit of God indwelling in us we're dead men walking around under a sentence of death just waiting for death to drop us into the pit of hell. But when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, by faith and put our trust in Him as our only Savior, our only means for salvation by His gift of giving His life on the cross, when we trust Him, then God sends His Spirit into our bodies to dwell with us forever and forever. And Jesus said the Spirit of God will abide with you forever. He shall never leave us. And wherever the Spirit of God is, the Bible says in verse 9, there is life. Without God's Spirit, you're dead. But with Him, you're alive. In verse number 12, the Bible tells us that the river has the power to refresh. And by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed, it shall bring forth new fruit according to his months because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary and the fruit thereof shall be for meat and the leaf thereof for medicine. So we see that there is, there is restoring, there's life, there's reviving and there is refreshing uh, from the river. But such is the power of the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the believer. The Bible says in John 7, verse 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That is the Spirit of God. So we see the source of the river in this vision. And we see the course of this river in this vision. And we see the power of the river in this vision. 
But what I want to speak to you now in the message is the depths of the river. The depths of the river. There was a judging day came. God sent forth a man with a line to judge the depths of this river. And as we watch Ezekiel go through the waters of this river and be delivered every time, we must ask ourselves this question as we look at these verses. How far have we stepped into the river? How far have you stepped into the river? I'm talking about the river of life. I'm talking about the Spirit of God. How far have you stepped into that river? I want you to notice, first of all, that the Bible tells us that when the man with the line in his hand measured, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. Now, if we were to study the cubits, we would find that from the throne to the end of the river was 6,000 cubits. Six being the number of man. We find here that in the first measurement that was taken, and this is what I want to draw your attention to, I want you to notice that in verse 3, the Bible said, the waters were to the ankles. The first step that that Ezekiel took into the river was only in ankle deep water. Why, that didn't take a whole lot of trouble. That didn't take a whole lot of faith that may seemingly be that it didn't take much faith to step out into ankle deep water. But let me tell you something. My friend, that picture of ankle deep water is the spirit of faith and is the picture of a new believer who is now not walking in the flesh, but walking in the spirit. And it may not seem like that we know a whole lot when we're first saved. It may not seem like we know anything when we're first saved. But my friend, it took a whole lot of faith to step off of that dry ground of self and of flesh and relinquish that dry land and take a step into that ankle deep water. And, and when we're first saved, it, it, there's not a whole lot going on. We're, we're learning. We're in the process of learning. The Bible says we're on the milk of the Word. We can't take meat yet. And so we're just taking little baby steps in ankle-deep water. And that's the proper place for a new convert to be. That's where they should be. But the problem is if you have people that have been saved 30 and 40 years and they're still wading in ankle-deep water, They're not where God wants them to be. They've not grown. They've not advanced. They've not matured. And so the Bible tells us to new believers that if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25. Walking in the Spirit means we're walking by faith. We're trusting by faith. We're living by faith. And so the Bible tells us in verse number 4 that the man with the line measured again and he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. But notice in verse verse 4 that this time the waters were to the knees. So the farther we go, the deeper the waters get in. Now we're up to the knees. What do the knees represent? The knees represent the spirit of prayer. The knees represent praying in the Spirit. Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. As a child of God, we are supposed to have not only stepped out into the ankle deep water by faith, unto salvation and start walking by faith and walking in the Spirit but we ought to be developing a prayer life prayer should become just second nature to us the Bible instructs us in everything 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your request known unto God Philippians 4 6 in everything the, the great and the small make it a matter of prayer and so the man of God is now delivered through ankle deep water and the man of God is now walking and he's wading in knee deep water he's getting closer to God He's giving himself more over to the Spirit of God. The journey goes on. And the Bible tells us in verse number 4, And again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. And this time, this says, the waters were to the loins. Now he's wading in waist deep water. Now this is the Spirit of service. We're getting in to the waters now and we're giving ourselves over to the Spirit of God and we're serving God. And, we're, and the Bible tells us that we're to serve God being fervent in spirit as we serve the Lord. And so the waters now are beginning to overtake us. But I want you to notice a common thread but through these first three waters that he treads. He tread through water to the ankles. Then he treaded through water to the knees. And now he's treading in water to the waist. But what is in common with all those three waters? He's still on his own feet. You can go out in the ocean in the ankles it won't bother you you won't even think about it even when you get up to the knees the, the breakers have already died down and are just coming into the shore and when you get up to the waist deep water uh, at least out here in the Atlantic anyway when the water's pretty clear you can still look down and see your feet when the water's up to your waist but when you get up to the waist you're starting to feel that tug you're starting to feel that undertow you're starting to feel something trying to draw you, but you're still on your feet. And you can, still, you can still dig in and hold yourself up. But I want you to notice the last waters that he went through. In verse 5, afterward he measured a thousand, he went up further. And the Bible says it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen. Waters to swim in. A river that could not be passed over. So now in his walk, now in his life, he's now in waters over his head. He's no longer on his feet. He no longer has control. He's got to swim now. Because he's no longer in control of his body. And let me tell you something. If you don't know how to swim, waters over your head can be a frightening thing. But I want to say something to you. And listen close. You will never be completely surrendered and full of the Spirit of God until you're in over your head. until you're in over your head. That's when you'll be full of the Spirit of God. Because when you're in over your head, you'll no longer control your life. When you're in over your head, you no longer can fix the situation. When you're in over your head, you must live by faith. And just like in our Sunday school lesson this morning, when Gideon got down to 300 men, the Lord said, there you go, that's what you need. And every step he took, he had to walk by faith and watch God bring that great victory. Waters to swim in is the fullness of the Spirit of God. Living in the Spirit. It is the fulfillment of, the, of Ephesians 5.18 
And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So how far have you stepped into the river? Well, I'm saved, preacher. I'm going to heaven. Praise God. I'm glad you are. Look forward to seeing you over there when we get home. But are you still standing over in ankle deep water? Well, I'm saved, but I'm, you know, I'm going to heaven. But are you living by faith? Perhaps you've gone past the ankle deep water and you've gotten a little closer to the Lord. And now you got your prayer life established, and you're you're in knee deep water. But you're just happy and satisfied over there in that knee deep water. Let me say something to you: you'll never be fully used of God in knee deep water. You'll really never know what God can do with you when you're just standing in knee deep water. If you want to know how good you can swim, you're going to have to move on out of that kiddie pool of knee deep water. Well, preacher, I'm in it up to my waist. Well, that's good. We appreciate your service. Continue on serving the Lord. Continue on doing something for Him. But how many of you have stepped out and you've stepped off the bottom and now you're in over your head? And everything you are and everything you do is being controlled by the Spirit of God. And you have relinquished your control. And if you're going to get out of the river now, it'll be God that gets you out of the river. If you're going to survive the river, it's God that's going to make you survive the river because you're full of the Spirit of God. God's fullness is always the answer to man's emptiness. Consider this. If you're walking in darkness today, Christ is your light. If you're in need of leadership, the Holy Spirit will be your guide. If you're hungry, Christ is the bread of life. If you're thirsty, Christ is the well of water springing up to eternal life. If you're tired, Christ will give you rest. If you're troubled, there is a peace of God that passes all understanding. If you've been scorched by sin, then Christ is the shadow of that rock in a weary land. If you're in need of purity, Christ is the lily of the valley. If you're in need of sweetness for your bitter spirit, Christ is the rose of Sharon. If you're weak, Christ is our strength. If you're neglected, Christ is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If you're lonely, Christ is the one who will never leave you or forsake you. If you're sick, He's the great physician of the souls of men. And if you're lost this morning and on your way to hell, Jesus came to seek and to save. Are you even in the river this morning? If not, I urge you to come and step into the river of life by trusting Christ as Savior. And child of God, consider where you are. How far out in the river have you gone? God wants you out there over your head. He wants you out there in the waters to swim in. There, your clay in the potter's hands, and He can use you. Let's bow our heads this morning. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we are so thankful for the Word of God. And thank you for letting us see this vision this morning. And Lord, you even ask Ezekiel if he saw it. And I ask the congregation this morning, did they see it? Did they see what you wanted them to see? And Lord, I pray if they did, they, hold, they don't hold back. Lord, if there's some that needs to step in the river of salvation by placing faith in Christ, we invite them to come this morning. If there are children of God that are saved and been saved a long time, but they're still just wading around in the ankle-deep, knee-deep, waist-deep water, but Lord, they've never stepped out on faith and got in over their head with you, I pray, Lord, that they would do that this morning. Have your will and way in the invitation, and we thank you for it. Amen. What's our number this morning?